five data center thing was a bit annoying because we thought, yay, we've, we've got this nomination for a finalist. Maybe we can do this. And then at and 75 data centers, and we were like, oh, man, oh, well, next year, maybe. We'll keep trying. Uh, we're doing the two to start with. <laughs> but, but, but I'll come on to that. Um, we're going to spend about 45, 50 minutes, and we're going to talk to you about our OpenStack journey. And the reason that this is important is a year ago when we started our OpenStack journey, the business cases from the foundation weren't being made yet. There weren't big companies up talking about how they'd done OpenStack at scale. So we, we made a promise to ourselves that when we got there, we would come and give back to the community and talk about our experience and hopefully inspire some of you that are either starting your journeys or, or the early on thinking about this journey, that it can be done and maybe take some learnings from how we've done it or the kit that we've used to put it together. So that's the intention. Um, I'm Richard Haig. I'm the head of delivery enablement. I look after tooling, production tooling, et cetera, for Paddy Power Betfair. Steve Armstrong uh, is principal automation engineer and soon to be famous author. Look for the book coming out. I oh, sorry, I promise I wouldn't mention that. I've done it again, haven't I? Oh, well. <laughs> um, let's talk you through the story. Um, I put this slide up at the start of all the presentations I do for a couple of reasons. One is that, especially outside of Europe, a lot of people don't know um, Paddy Power Betfair or Betfair at, uh, at the time that it was at, uh, before the merger. Um, and the second is that the, it sets the context. And the context is really around these numbers in the middle here. Part of Betfair's um, products, one of the main things that we became famous for was a betting exchange. And it's exactly the same as a financial exchange, but instead of making positions against the outcome of financial markets, you can put positions against the outcome of sporting um, events. And as a result, just like every other financial exchange, we get used by high frequency traders. And as a result, we have to stand up infrastructure that can cope with that level um, of thrashing. And the, the thrashing is around about three and a half Three and a half, three point seven billion API calls a day. That's Twitter territory a few years ago. Um, it's around about 130 million DB transactions committed every day. So it's a large estate. So a year ago, when we were looking at is OpenStack right for us, we had questions around could an infrastructure build on OpenStack cope with this kind of transactions, um, and, and we think it can. And we'll talk you through how we've got there. Of course, earlier this year we merged with Paddy Power to become Paddy Power Betfair. Um, uh, the context of this is around the Betfair technology, the Paddy Power and the Betfair technology will merge over time, but at the moment this is really uh, a story about the Betfair side. So let's, let's go from the beginning, how did it begin? Well, we, we'd grown over about 10 years or so, um, we'd, uh, the infrastructure as you can imagine had got bigger over time, and we got to the point where although the current infrastructure was running fine, we could kind of see the edges. We knew that we would do a refresh cycle and we needed to, to put something new in. So we decided to go back to the drawing board um, and look for a, a second generation of infrastructure. We called this project I2, infrastructure. Generation 2, not the most invented name, but I2 was what it was called. And really, it was about there to enable us to deliver speed and scale. We wanted to go faster, a lot faster. We had to keep up with the, the ever-growing business. We wanted to put the control into the hands of the developers. We wanted to be a, a, an AWS in-house that was as easy to use and as easy for the developers to pick up and work with. So that was the kind of the business needs. And like all good projects, we, we wrote down the specs that we needed on the back of an envelope to achieve this. So we wanted to have our DCs to be resilient. There's no point setting this up in one if we have a bad weekend and we, fail, we can't fail over to the second. We wanted to have a software-defined network. And this was quite interesting because at the start, we, we saw the advantage of, of an SDN because it allows us to control it as code, source control it, push it out as code, mutate it much more quickly. Um, but going out to market and saying, hey guys, based on the transactional throughput we put across our networks, can you, can you help us with an SDN? It, it wasn't really the kind of thing a lot of businesses were doing at the time, or certainly not talking about. We got to the point where we actually got two independent networking contractors in and said, come in, spend a couple of weeks with us, understand us, go out to the market and work out what's happening in the SDN space and come back and give us a recommendation. And very usefully, the first one came back and said, don't do it. Don't go anywhere near it. It's not a mature technology. No one's really using it. People have bought licenses, but they haven't implemented it. It's not going to work. And the second one came back and said, oh my god, it's brilliant. It's the only thing you should do is, is take the SDN, definitely use it. It's going to be game changing. So we thought, oh, crap, OK. So, um, <laughs> so um, we decided we'd go for it. We put some, I'll talk through some of the mitigations we did servers using the same tool chains, the same methodology, if you like, as we were going for virtual or potentially containers in the future. So it's important at the start that we kept that in mind as well. Um, of course, we wanted rich APIs. Um, we're not really fans of GUIs. We really wanted to do everything as code. So having an API around all of this was incredibly important, not only to set it up, but to allow us to continue to develop against it. Um, and of course, it needed to scale. And of course, it needed to be compliant uh, for security reasons. We're a, we're a regulated business. It's very important that we can show that we have a compliant estate. So that was the back of the envelope. Um, we then had an important decision to make. And that was, did we go and buy something off the shelf? 
or do we go for one of these open source projects and actually see if we can get this to work? Now, to put in context, Betfair at the time, uh, it's quite a large engineering company, about half the staff were engineers. We had a lot of history of taking open source tooling, um, various other bits of software, using it, consuming it, giving back to the communities. Um, we weren't afraid of taking this. We weren't afraid of bringing it in in-house. So maybe the risks for us were a little less than some of the more traditional um, IT shops around. Um, the other thing that we particularly didn't want to do was lock ourselves into a long vendor agreement. We didn't want a three-year or five-year deal that meant in a year's time, when we see the newest thing coming, we couldn't adapt to it, couldn't take it. So in the end, we decided, let's go for an open source community project. Let's look at OpenStack. Let's take something that we can change at a pace that suits us, that we can commit back to with the lessons that we learned and become part of the community, which we're used to doing as well. And so our journey began. And it's been an interesting journey over the last year. Um, we've gone through a proof of concept, a pilot. Um, I'm going to talk you through some of the project phases in a minute. Um, we were lucky enough to be nominated for the Super User Awards. Only AT&T hadn't put that 75th data center in. We might have done it. <laughs> We've had an innovation award through Red Hat. So the, the stuff we're working on is, is good, and it works. And, and the message I'm trying to pass around is it's, it's fit for production. It is fit for enterprise. And we're an example of that where it, it is working, um, and it is fit for the purpose. So let's talk you through the program. Um, there were four main projects inside the program. The first was a proof of concept. And this really was, we'd finished our RFP, we'd gone out to the market and answered who could help. We'd chosen um, Red Hat to come in and give us a supported OpenStack installation so on top of KVM. We'd chosen Nuage to give us a software-defined network. And the three of us decided to become a three-way partnership um, and go for this project. So the first task we set was a, a very aggressive four-week proof of concept. We had a couple of racks of kits stood up, and we wanted to put in place a representative OpenStack environment. Really, what we wanted to do was prove that what these guys had said on paper, they could actually do in real life. And then we wanted to test the hell out of it and make sure that it would stand up to uh, the kind of performance environments that we were expecting. And after, we'd all, after the suppliers had got back up off the floor, falling off to do this in four weeks, we set to work. And we, and we did it. In four weeks' time, we stood this up, we tested it, and we unlocked the business case to go into the next phase. What we actually learned from this is we're all used to putting out our apps by code. This is one of Betfair's mobile betting apps. Um, we're all used to taking our operating systems and encoding the, uh, the, the um, provisioning of those through CI, CD. But actually, what we've taken from this proof of concept is we could actually encode our firewalls. We can encode our storage, our switching. Um, we can encode the provisioning of, of the bare metal. We could do that as code. We could do everything as code. And it's this dot, dot, dot as code, this everything as code that was actually the most important thing for us. So for the first time, we could encode um, our networks, our firewall rules, how much storage, all as YAML files, all checked into source control, all driven by the intent of the development teams. And our tooling would pick this up and produce the infrastructure to support them. And because it's as code, we can source control it. We can roll it back. We can share it. Um, the living documentation that comes as that comes for free. So all of this became incredibly important to us to be able to stand this up and execute it at the, at the pace that we wanted to for the dev community. And of course, for that, we have a tool chain. Steve will talk through some more of this later, but the basics there, you'll recognize most of these. Some of them you might not. Qualys, for example, is a security product. It's usually an appliance. And what it does, is it allows you to test the hardening of an operating system once it's stood up. Um, it's usually an appliance you plug in, and you don't do anything with it. We had a guiding principle that all of these tools we would take in and we'd put into their own pipelines. All of the infrastructure would have its own pipeline and would be delivered in the same way. So we'll, we'll build and we'll stand up a latest quality stand immutably. We'll test products that come down and then we destroy it all again, the same as you would expect any other product that we'd put through. Steve will give you more details about these later, though. So the next phase was the pilot, uh, which we've also now completed. The pilot was meant to be around about six months long. It overran a little bit. Um, we had a few niggles. We had a very large spring racing season, which we put a, a fairly large chain freeze in place where we're doing that, so we hit that as well. But within this kind of six, seven months, we threw away the proof of concept kit, and we stood up from scratch what would become the seeds, the basics of what would be our production environment. So now we're building these things resiliently. There are three controllers everywhere, not one. We're building them lockstep in both DCs. Every box that goes into our first DC, we get a mirror in the second. The networks are resilient. The storage is resilient. The computers are resilient across racks, et cetera. And we started to build this up. And over that six-month period, what we had to do was put in place all of that delivery tool chain and make it fit for production. We had to show that we could take our applications and migrate them in um, and stand up this OpenStack environment for real. We also chose to go OS OSP 7 at this point. Um, 7 came with Director for the first time over 6, which would make 7 to 8 or to 9 a much easier upgrade later on. So we decided as part of this um, pilot project, we'd also bring in our first, try our first upgrade to make sure we could do that as well. 
And for us, the pilot finished when we took a couple of our real applications, moved them onto this estate, and ran production traffic through them and threw away their old estate and decommissioned it. So that was a sign of success, was we've got our minimum viable product out, we're running it in production, it's got real customer traffic going through it. And that was a few months back. And what came out of this is what we're calling our reference stack, selfishly calling our reference stack, because I'm trying to promote this. And the reason being is I want people who are thinking, oh, does this work, does that work, to look at an example of the stuff that does, in the hope that you'll use this stack, in the hope that these guys get more R&D dollars, which means I then get a better product out the other end as well. So I'm shamelessly promoting the stack, if you like. Actually, we found this quite useful. The other reason I put this up is a year ago when we were looking and we were trying to work out who do we work with, who do we bolt in here, um, we found it very hard to find vendors who would say these things work well together when we've proven it. So part of our commitment back is to share and be open with what we've done. So we're into the final two projects now, the onboarding and the decommissioning. Um, the onboarding is just that. We've got around 200 microservices that will come across. Um, some of them are small, some of them are large, but we will now work through each of those to migrate them away from the old estate into the new estate. And then with that also comes the decommissioning. So we need to tear down the old kit, predominantly to physically free up space in the DCs, but also there's no point keeping it there. It's old, it's, it's running, it's using heat and all that kind of stuff. So for the dev teams, there's a couple of things they need to think about. Some of them are used to working active passively across the DCs, and they need to consider, especially some of the stateful applications, how they will move to an active-active um, environment. Now we've put in place the capability for that. Some of them need to make their minds up about virtual versus physical. Um, in our previous virtualizations, contention was not something under the control of the devs. So you would have a great day on a Tuesday, and on Wednesday, everything would grind to a halt, and you couldn't figure out why. And it's because someone else got noisy and was just happened to be sharing the tenancy with you. The new model means that the devs have a ring fence tenancy. That noisy neighbor problem goes away. So they can now reevaluate, actually, is virtualiz virtualization, the portability I get from that, is it now right for me? And actually, the more we look at it, the more teams are now saying, OK, we've done our testing. Virtualization seems pretty good. Maybe we can go for that. Um, and that self-selection of flavor and contention as well, just like you could do with AWS, the dev teams will be able to pick how many vCPUs, how much memory, how much disk. Um, and that's not from a list we've defined. The devs can define those flavors to each of them. Each of the teams can have their own, and then they can pick from their own flavors um, what they will um, what they'll deploy to. So again, it's really about that, that self-service model, getting it to work for the devs and us running it, I guess, behind the scenes. And then for my teams in infrastructure, we've predominantly got to, to switch off the old kit and free up that space. So the onboarding challenge, it's a little joke coming here. So no matter how you dress it up, it's, it's still a marathon. This is still the biggest part of the project. Oh, I've got to laugh. Okay, it works. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of things to put in here on top of the technology. And in fact, the culture, that top one, is probably the biggest part of this project. We've gone from teams who have either let ops do this all for them or from teams who have to... Uh, um, always just deploy on top in a mutatable way their, their um, applications over and over. We're moving them to an immutable model. We're moving them to where they have some ownership and some accountability around their own infrastructure. And for some of them, that's a, that's a significant change. So we have to help them do that. We have to help that culture. Um, tooling adoption. Some people are very religious around tooling, and they don't like the tools that you've got. Some people care less. Trying to educate the, the tool chain that we have Although it works, it's not fixed. And actually, with the APIs we have, it's designed that we can upgrade it. We can swap it out. We can move it somewhere in the future. But we're trying to consolidate down to a single tooling methodology, if you like, across the business. Economies of scale, easier support, et cetera. We've got, just like every other business doing this, the problem of legacy and lost apps. We've got some applications where we don't write in that language any longer, but that app is still running. So we've got to work out how do we unpick those and how do we migrate those and move those across. Maybe it's a rewrite. Maybe it's a consolidation of that function into some other app. But the challenge is there as well. And of course, throughout all of this, we've not slowed down. Um, our CEO is very famous for going, that's a good plan. If I give you some more money, could you do it faster? So we've had that relentless pace, that relentless um, change still happening. And of course, we've gone through a merger as well with Paddy Power and Betfair at the same time. But this project hasn't slowed down, hasn't been allowed to. So all of this has accumulated into, as with all projects as they come together, um, just having to keep on delivering and keep on delivering as we go through it. Right, that's the business bit out of the way. I'm going to hand over to Steve, who will talk you through some of the technology. <laughs> We, we, <laughs> I got a laugh for that one as well. Um, we, we were going to do a live demo at the end of this. So I think we're going to be tight on time. What we'll probably do is uh, take one of the Ignite sessions later. If you want to come and have a look at it actually happening, come and find us later on, and we'll talk you through that. Thanks. Cool. All right. So this is basically what it looks like in terms of the technology stack. So we run two data centers. We run them active active. So at the top, we've got our global load balancer solution with UltraDNS. 
coming in at the top and then we have two external Juniper firewalls leading down to two tiers of Netscaler. The first tier of the Netscaler is used for SSL offloading in the hardware device and then that comes through into the second tier of Netscaler that is used for content switching down to the microservice applications. And that then comes into the Nuage overlay network, uh, which has a loose spine topology connected through the Arista. Um, we run two open stacks per DC, and then we've got our flash storage solution uh, with pure storage that hooks in as a cinder driver for that. We're also looking at NetApp and integrating that with the Manila project. Um, and we use uh, Red Hat Director to <coughs> basically install our OpenStack. Okay, so at the OpenStack level, we run two pair DC because um, what we've done is we've put all our delivery tooling and monitoring in one OpenStack and then the test environment and production workloads in another. We wanted to separate that because different OpenStacks will run different types of services. So essentially, we wanted to give the teams the flexibility of being able to deploy the projects that they wanted due to their different use cases. Uh, we run the Kilo version at the moment, so that's OSP7, and it's a Red Hat distribution. Okay, so we have a very minimal libvert layer, which basically runs all of our, um, it's basically the Arista CDX servers, which is the Cloud Vision platform, and we also run a lot of the, the new edge components on that. So that's a very minimal footprint. Also, uh, we need core services to power um, OpenStack. So we use NTP, DNS, LDAP, they all set in libvert outside. Because when we were building this, we needed the core services before you could actually provision OpenStack. So that's a very minimal footprint. Uh, for Arista, for the switching, as uh, I mentioned, we use the Arista CVX. So we use zero touch provisioning for this. So what we do is basically um, we use uh, the Arista to um, basically when you you rack and cable the switch, it goes to the CVX server, pulls the config, and then does a zero touch provisioning. So as we scale out, we'll be able to just push the code that way. That's all checked into source control as well, and we do that using Ansible. So this is what it looks like from a rack location. So with our leaf spine topology, you have your spine switches at the top, so this is a completely scaled out model. So as we onboard more microservices applications, we can just scale out the racks. So Arista sits top of racks. So we have two, two switches sitting on each. And they are configured in MLAG mode for redundancy. And we use a layer 3 routine protocol using BGP. Uh, we have different profiles of rack as well. So we have our uh, compute racks, our infrastructure racks, and our infrastructure racks, that's all the networking kit sits there. And then we have our storage rack, which has pure storage in it and NetApp. And then our compute racks are basically for um, our customer facing applications. We also are looking at having a bare metal rack. So for that, we will set the, the Nuage VSG top of rack as opposed to the Arista. So we're looking at doing that in the future. So one of the key things for us in this implementation was our Nuage implementation. One of the, the challenges we really had was integrating the uh, native network with the new Greenfield OpenStack implementation that we were putting in. So what Nuage has allowed us to do is bridge that network and allow us to integrate it seamlessly. We're not doing a big bang here, so we're not switching on the 200 TLA uh, applications at once. So what we are doing is we're migrating some into OpenStack and then bridging back. So Nuage has allowed us to do this. So the Nuage components are broken down. The VSD it basically creates the overlay network, and that's really the policy engine that manages all the ACL rules. So we switch off uh, security groups and OpenStack and use um, the subnets managed by Nuage in VSD manage mode. Uh, the VSC is basically the controller for Nuage, which pushes down uh, OpenFlow to each of the hypervisors. And then VRS is basically the customized version of OpenV switch that sits on each of the compute nodes. So Nuage actually allows for the bare metal nodes to uh, the 
they use OpenFlow as well, so you can have a minimal VRS that sits on the bare metal nodes or even within a container, so that's something that they've introduced as well for those workloads. The VSG is what's allowed us to actually bridge back to the native network, so you can put in all the routing. Uh, so everything is essentially routable um, in the native network where all the other applications run. Uh, and then we lock down the policy so that they can only be using the NUAGE ACL rules. So this is kind of what the NUAGE object model looks like. So this is how it looks in software. So essentially you have an organization that sits at the top layer uh, and then you create a layer three domain template that hangs off of that. So the layer three domain template is basically your common uh, sets of policies that you want to apply to all the layer three domains. So what we've done is each layer three domain um, maps to a specific availability zone in OpenStack. And then basically it has the notion of zones. So each zone <laughs> is specific to a particular microservice. So we'll have 200 zones. Then off of that, you've got your layer three subnet, which is mapped one to one with the subnet in OpenStack seamlessly. So when um, development teams basically provision VMs, they will essentially um, have a one-to-one -one mapping with NuAge and that's seamless to them using the automation. Um, we used the SDN obviously as Rich touched upon before uh, because we wanted the flexibility because the Neutron component and the scale that we wanted to run at. Uh, NuAge was kind of key on that because we could go to the point where we're going to have 500 different hypervisors running per DC. Um, so that was really key as well. So this is how it looks in terms of the hierarchy when you deploy. So you've got your virtual machines that are deployed in OpenStack. You've basically got your subnet. We use AV subnets. So everything that we do is completely immutable. So basically deploy, the first deployment will go into subnet A. Um, and then what that does is it means that when we deploy subnet B, we never actually do an in-place update on the ACL rules because you don't want to affect production. Um, so that will come in alongside it. When we're happy, we'll switch them over onto the load balancer, load balance them, and then decommission the previous release. So we've got completely immutable networks, completely immutable um, ACL rules. And that also means that the cleanup of ACL rules is completely automated too. And we use immutable infrastructure. So Essentially, any state that we've got is persisted on the pure storage or the NFS. So this is how the integration basically works with uh, New Edge and OpenStack. So the VSD uh, plugs into the Neutron component, so it's got a REST API call. So we use that plugin. And then basically, it just works where um, the VSD basically just talks XMPP to the VSC pushes OpenFlow down to the VRS that sits in the hypervisor. So it's using an open vSwitch implementation with the SDN. So in terms of what the delivery team's got, that it was very important that we put in a model of, that they were familiar with. So all development teams essentially are uh, comfortable doing continuous integration. So what we did was we wanted to create a model of continuous integration for them. So Networking was controlled using a CI build. Uh, basically, all of our platform templates that we use in terms of the images that are deployed to Glance are all continuous integration builds. So it's pulling everything into continuous integration. So each team got their own ring fence tenant because they only cared about their own particular microservices. One of the things that, one of the main complaints for them was they had noisy neighbors at different uh, sporting events, which could adversely affect the application. So what we've done is we've given them ring fence compute using host aggregates. Um, so they can basically define when they're deploying what compute nodes that their machines actually land on. So we use the, uh, the Nova scheduler uh, functionality. So it's the extra specs filter where we tag metadata on a particular flavor and host aggregate so that it lands in the specific location. So other than that, we wanted to give them a choice. So we wanted to be able to give them the choice of bare metal or VMs. We've done our VM workflow. The next point in the project, we're going to be looking at using uh, Ironic to do the um, bare metal um, overcloud provisioning. 
Uh, we use Ironic on the undercloud to basically scale out all of our hypervisors currently. So we're looking at that implementation as well. The other things as well is, as Rich said before, we wanted to um, allow development teams to control their own ACL policies. So what we do is a deny all for each application. And essentially what they do is they open up the minimum amount of ACL rules that they need for their microservices to talk to other applications. So security are very happy around that because they can audit the particular policies per microservice. And also one of the other things we've done is we had a big monolith of um, essentially uh, load balancer file. What we've done is we've broken that down so each particular team, their own load balancing is defined in YAML files so that they can specify that. So if we wanted to move to a whole new data center, we could build out the whole network and everything within within minutes. So that was really key for us. So this is what the tool chain looks like. So a developer will essentially check in their change to their microservice application. It's checked into GitLab. Jenkins will then trigger a CI build. It will then roll up into a package manifest file. So as I said before, all of our, um, all of our networking and platform templates, etc., are all defined as CI builds. So what the manifest file does is it just rolls up all those CI builds at the, the particular version and then rolls into the manifest. The manifest then controls all the versioning of your networking, your code, everything. That's then uploaded to Artifactory. So when a new candidate for release, a new manifest is available, then that means a new release candidate will be triggered for the continuous delivery process. So ThoughtWorks Go picks that up, schedules the pipeline, and then we use Ansible for all our common workflow actions, such as spinning up VMs, etc. And then that triggers the APIs for OpenStack. What we wanted to do with OpenStack was use it as a middleware. So essentially, any, any vendor, we could, if it's got a driver, we can just plug it in. So we try as much as possible to go to the OpenStack APIs directly so that we can substitute things out. Uh, but we have to go to Nuage and Citrix just because their APIs are more rich than the currently available OpenStack ones at the moment. So this is kind of what our pipeline stages look like, and I, I can show you this later in one of the lightning talks. So each of these is just basically an Ansible playbook, so that it's very easy to debug, and that's a stage in the pipeline. So what we've done is we've standardized this for all our teams. So the unique bit and takeaway, I won't go through all the stages, is the, um, is the run chef or run Ansible, because each each of our delivery teams looks after their own install of their microservice application. So we're giving them the option to use Chef or use Ansible. We were using Chef before. So rewriting everything wasn't really an option, but some of the teams have chosen to move to Ansible now. But we allow them that template to do that. So that will install the particular application. All of the other stuff should be the same for all teams. So we don't want to support multiple different ways of doing the same action because it makes it harder to support. Uh, the rolling update as well is customizable because some of the stateful applications will have different ways of doing this. So we're provided a pluggable template where they can write a very minimal playbook that will allow them to deal with the state. So some of the things that they were doing is we've got, um, for instance, one of our Cedar applications for our traders. They, needed, they don't use a load balancer, so they don't create the VIP or anything. They'll essentially just switch C names over and we allow different operations like that so that we've got a consistent set of templates so it's quite flexible. Okay, so the benefits of this was treating infrastructure as code. Everything is checked into source control, controlled via YAML files using Ansible. Uh, the teams also get their own, the ability to provision their own host aggregates. So when we onboard them, they come in for a two week period to onboard their application in a sprint. At which point we allocate them their particular hypervisors and what we do is they have to Tetris block fit them onto the hypervisor so that they use up all the capacity. We've also developed a capacity tool that we'll probably show at a later OpenStack day. Okay. In terms of um, generating the OS level, we, we run CentOS 6, CentOS 7, Windows 2008 R2 and Windows 2008, uh, 2012 R2 images. All of these are automated using Packer, so we build these once a week. These are all patched up to the latest level, security hardened. So, uh, and then the spin-up times are quite key. 
uh, 10 seconds for a Linux box and two minutes for a Windows box. That's fully sysprep, so Windows takes a bit longer because it's, it's Windows, right? Uh, not that we don't like Windows. Um, okay, so in, in terms of the SDN uh, benefits, basically each of the teams check in their um, ACL rules into source control, so they don't have to wait on tickets, so that was very key. Before they would have to raise a ticket with the network team, wait on a waterfall process. Now it's a self-service model that they can just get this as quickly as possible. One of the main points as well is with the AB networking, one of the main benefits that has is each pipeline essentially is just hitting an API endpoint. So when we're doing an upgrade, we can essentially not do an in-place upgrade of OpenStack. We can just have an immutable OpenStack, so spin up the new one in parallel, flip the API endpoint, and then it just deploys onto the B subnet where the old release is on the A, and then we just federate it and recycle the hypervisor. So that's really key because we don't have to do an in-place update. It's a very good usage of the, the SDN solution. Again, uh, basically the automation benefits for load balancers, everything's in source control, um, and it's modularized as well so that we know what's going on and it's not, it's not like you don't have any fear if you're going to change it. So the overall benefits are providing an IaaS solution to our teams. We've solved the noisy neighbor issue. We don't have ticketing for networking and compute. Uh, we deploy it across two data centers. So we design all of our, when we give, when teams on board onto production, we basically give them a hypervisor that's split across two racks. So we give them two. So if you lose a rack, essentially they won't lose all of the application in the DC. Then what they can do is update their YAML file, put in an emergency hypervisor, do another deployment within seven minutes. It gets it back up to full capacity again. As I mentioned before, automated firewall cleanup. We use immutable deployments for everything, so every week there's a new template that goes through. That goes through QE, integration environment, per prod. We don't do any in-place patching. It all comes from source control, pushed all the way through. An average of seven minutes. So that varies based on test packs as well, but that's basically the, the core actions. So going on to our roadmap, this is what we've kind of got planned. Um, Basically, before Christmas, we're going to skip a release because we don't need to do an in-place upgrade. So we're going to go from Kilo straight to the Metaka. And that brings quite a lot of benefits because the Ironic project moved on quite a bit there. So we're, we're keen to get that in place for our bare metal requirements. And one of the other things that's really key for us is we're looking at um, the Ironic integration with, with Nuage. So at this point, um, and this is quite a good implementation. What they can do is they can bring it into a layer three tenant using Nuage. So what they do is you run your bare metal on a layer two network, essentially just to provision it. When what Nuage have done is they've got a little bit of code where when you reboot it, it actually brings it into the tenant layer three domain and essentially gives it a new IP address. So then you can ring fence your, your bare metal server with layer three policies. So that's really key for us as well, because we don't want the flat layer two tenant. Um, one of the other things, we want to consolidate our, our third party VPNs. So Nuage offer a solution, a VNS solution for that, among other uh, VPN solutions. So we're, we're going through that just now, because what we want to do is to be able to not have the network team have to basically manually configure third party VPNs. For instance, because we're uh, working with um, Sportsbook, essentially we have feeds that come in from different providers. We want to automate that fully with this process. The other thing as well is the Manila project wasn't fully integrated in the current release of uh, OpenStack, so we're, we're, we're wanting to do that. Currently, we just go to NetApp APIs directly, but we want to use the Manila project for that and develop some an Ansible modules so that we can manage it properly. Other than that, we've got our brand new exchange. So what we'll be doing is uh, mounting the journal files on that, on pure storage, and then running our exchange completely on OpenStack. So we've already got around um, six or seven of our exchange components running on OpenStack, but the main one uh, that puts through the bet placement will, will go on. So we're going to have a 
with our rolling update process, we'll basically keep the persistent journal files sitting on pure storage volumes connected to VMs using Cinder and then basically roll, roll the releases through at the OS level. Uh, another thing for backup and restore, we're looking at the OpenStack Freezer project, the HP um, deal with. What that will allow us to do is, because we've got Nuage and um, OpenStack, we've basically got the networking databases need to be consistently uh, backed up at the same time. So what this will allow us to do is do a synchronous backup of the two databases to allow us and also orchestrate all our backups through the OpenStack APIs. And then we're looking, because we've looked at bare metal VMs, we're also exploring what we do with containers. So we're looking at, do we go Magnum or just put Kubernetes on top of OpenStack standalone? Because you could do either. Um, so we'll be investigating that post upgrade into Metaka. And that's basically it. Bang on so, time. Yeah. So if you have any questions. I don't know, I think we literally are bang on time, so we've probably not got time for questions now, but we, we are around. From, you can't miss me wearing this, so if you've got <laughs> questions, come, come find us and we'll talk to you then. Cool.